if only so people will understand that this didn't come out of left field, that this was totally predictable if you simply understood how the government was screwing everything up. Uh, Peter, listen, I've heard you many times uh, tell people to go search for that speech. And here's the reason that I called. What I did is I took that speech and I made a website called Spectacular Prediction. So anytime you go to the uh, spectacularprediction.com, it plays your speech, your mortgage broker's speech. Now, the reason that I did that is because more people will see it if it's easier to find. If you tell people to do a search on Yahoo, people are lazy and they don't like doing searches, and it's not a direct route. So you need a direct route. More people will see it if you have a direct route. Yeah, well, that's good. I've also got it on my Europac website under, you know, presentations. I have a link to it from the Europac site. It's up there on, you know, a lot of people search, you know, on YouTube, Peter Schiff Mortgage Bankers. It comes up number one. So, But what's your site? You put it on Spectacular Predictions, so yeah, there's another way. That's singular, spectacular prediction. But, but here's the second point. Here's the second point that's even more important. And, yes, you have it on your site, but you have to get your fans to put it on their personal sites. Once they have it on their personal sites and they have a link to it also perhaps on their Facebook page, then what happens is the Google search engine will end up ranking that speech high in its results. And so here's the goal. You want it to be in the, in the top ten ranked results when people do a search for mortgage. So if someone's going to buy a house and they want to research mortgages, they go to Google, they search under mortgage, and boom, up comes your speech on the, top, on the first page in the top ten results. Then you'll have your millions of views. Well, that'd be good if we could but, but pull that off. The way to make that happen is to drive it higher in the rank results, and the way you do that is by having many people link to it. You have to ask your fans to link to it on their Facebook page and their personal page. Oh, all right. Well, hear that. I mean, there's, you know, I think we've got about 50,000 daily listeners on the show. So if, if each one of those, everybody is on Facebook, if they put a link to uh, Peter Schiff Mortgage Bankers, maybe that'll help it. Not maybe. It, it will. <laughs> that, that's not a maybe. It, that's yeah. algorithmically how it happens with yeah. the Google search results. All right. Well, thanks, thanks for the heads up. And just the one other repeat there. If you want to give out, uh, if, when, you want, when you want to promote the speech, tell people to go to Spectacular Prediction. Rather than yeah. the, the multi step. Also, process. another really good speech I gave that does have about 250,000 views. I don't know if you saw this one. It was uh, Why the Meltdown Should Have Surprised No One. That was uh, from uh, when I gave the keynote at the Mises Institute a couple of years ago in Auburn. That's a really good speech. Like I have, there's a lot of laughs in that speech, so people, uh, people really enjoy it. I, I, yes, I enjoyed that speech as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot. Hey, you know, I've got some more sound, this time not from the, uh, the legislatures, but from a teacher. Listen to this. This is Nancy Reich, who's a middle school teacher who was on CNN. You know, they're asking her about, you know, her being on strike. And listen, listen to how she justifies her actions. This is cut number seven. And a lot of kids are out of school. We heard from some teachers who think you should be in the classroom. How long will you be out there? Tell us why. I'm out here. I'm out here for my students. I would love to be teaching, but I'm out here for their rights. I'm out here for their voice. If I don't be out here for them, we're going to lose this. We have started collective bargaining in 1959. For 52 years, we've been out here. And now all of a sudden, Governor Scott Walker wants to say, forget it, no voice. We are not out here about the pay and the benefits. We are out here for our voice. He is trying to bust our unions. He is trying to not give us a voice. We need a voice for everyone. We're not just speaking about Wisconsin unions, Wisconsin schools. We're speaking about America. America. Oh, that's rich. So they're out there for the kids, for the students. I mean, come on. I mean, how are the students benefiting from the teachers being on strike because they want to protect their union, which is at odds with the kids. The unions are not there to make sure that the kids get a good education. The unions are there to make sure that the teachers get a lot of money, regardless of whether or not the kids have a good education. That's why they're against any kind of merit pay. They don't want incentives uh, to give the kids a good education. That's why they're all against the voucher system. The, t the unions don't want parents to have the ability to pull their kids out of failed public schools and put them in a decent private school. They don't care about the kids at all. That's a bunch of nonsense. She's making out like, well, 
it's it's for, it's for their rights too, so that when they grow up, they can become teachers and get into a union, and they can help rip off the taxpayers just like we are. I mean, that's all a bunch of bunch of hogwash. And when she's talking about her voice, her voice, she's got a voice. She doesn't need a union to have a voice. She nobody forces her to take a job as a teacher. If she doesn't like the pay, if she doesn't like the benefits, she can quit. And you know what? If she's a good teacher and she wants to earn more money, she can go to her boss. She can go to the school district and say, look, here's all the letters I got from parents. Here's the great test scores that my kids are getting. I want you to give me a raise or I'm going to take all my good references and I'm going to go and work in a, at, a, at, a, at a private school for more money. And so they still have a voice. You, you can negotiate on your own. You don't have to be in a union. You don't have to have collective bargaining to have a voice. Listen to the rest of this interview because it, it, here, this is cut number eight. Ms. Reich, can I ask you, you, you talk about coming to the table, the governor coming to the table. Do you think it was the right tactic for the, the Democratic senators? United, we stand. Not United, we stand. United we stand. United we stand. United okay. we stand. United we stand. Ms. Rice, thank you very much. I'm not sure she can hear me, but Ms. Rice, we appreciate your time and obviously very passionate about this particular issue. Uh, we're going to have this debate. We're going to be keeping a very close eye on what is taking place there because this is playing out across the country. Yeah, so instead of being upset that the guest is ignoring the question, refuses to answer the question, and just goes into her protest chant about united we stand, she makes excuses. She pretends, well, maybe she can hear. Of course she can hear. She doesn't want to answer the question. She just wants to protest. Yeah, united. It's united against the students. She stands against the students that she says she's protesting for. She's protesting for herself. She wants to keep enjoying a, a higher rate of pay than she could get in the private sector. She wants to force the taxpayers of the state of Wisconsin to pay her more than she's worth. And you remember, the teachers, they work nine months. They got all this vacation time. They, they get off work early every day. What, they work till three o'clock? It's, it's not a hard job, and it's very rewarding. Being a teacher is great. You get to educate kids. What's that worth? Anyway, don't go away. I got a fantastic guest, the great Kama Soul, coming up after the break. So don't go away. You're listening to Peter Schiff on SchiffRadio.com. Second hour is now underway, and I'm very happy to have my next guest, uh, Thomas Soul, who is an economist, uh, social critic, syndicated columnist. He's been a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute since 1980. He has authored many, many books, I think over 30 books. Recently, uh, he released the fourth edition of his book, Basic Economics. Uh, that was just uh, published December 28th of 2010. I think the original uh, Basic Economics came out a few years ago. And, I, you know, I really need to update my recommended reading list on Europac.net. I've only got one Thomas Sowell book up on my list. Uh, that's Knowledge and Decisions, which was written in 1980. And I first read that when I was in college, and I thought that was an excellent book, and it really helped influence and shape my way of thinking. So if you want to know, you know, how I develop my understanding of economics, you can credit people like Thomas Sowell, who blazed the trail, and it made it very easy for me to follow. Anyway, Mr. Sowell, welcome uh, to my show. Well, God, good to be here with you. So, um... The, the the newest edition of your book, um, how is that? How was uh, basic economics originally received, and is there anything uh, in, in the timing of releasing the fourth edition? No, well, it was very well received. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a fourth edition. <laughs> uh, over the years, the, it's been translated into six foreign languages. So uh, apparently, there are people out there who want to understand economics, but who don't want to get bogged down in graphs and equations. Uh, this book has has neither. Uh, in terms of size, this book is uh, more than twice the size of the first edition, and uh, part of it is, uh, is updating. Sometimes there are new chapters, for example, on uh, government finance, and on the most recent uh, edition, there's a chapter on how, how economics itself evolved over the centuries. Yeah, we need to. We need, you need to get a, re, a, re, a version though where you use very simple words so that we can get it appropriate for Congress. <laughs> because they really need to understand. We are really in one hell of an economic mess right now. Absolutely. Uh, you're saying about Congress, it reminds me when I was an economist in the government, and I was preparing uh, some material to be presented by the Secretary of Labor to Congress, 
And I wrote it in, in, you know, the most simple form, and yet my supervisor said to me, oh, Tom, you're talking over the congressman's head. And I had to ask, uh, where is their head? Yeah, well, it's 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 impossible to talk beneath their heads. No yeah. matter where you talk, you're gonna. But it must be very frustrating for you, as it is for me, to look at all these problems unfolding, and they make perfect sense. We know exactly what the cause is, but then the problem is the government the, the, the misdiagnoses the disease, and we know the prescriptions that they have are just going to make the situation worse. Oh, oh, absolutely. I think if someone would ask me, what what do, what do I think would get the economy moving again fastest? And it would be for Barack Obama to shut up and for he and Congress to do nothing for the next six months. I think the, I think the uh, rise of the economy would just absolutely astonish people. But, of course, they can't do nothing, and he, and he certainly cannot uh, keep quiet. Well, I think, though, they've already done so much damage to the economy thus far that doing nothing at this point isn't even an option. They really have to undo some of the things that they've already done. Well, I think if they would just stop making things worse, things you know, people don't understand that for more than 100 years, it was never the, the job of the federal government to get the economy out of a recession. During that long period, which ended in 1930, uh, all the recoveries were faster than the recoveries in which the government intervened. All right, and I always make the point that we get out of these recessions not because of the government intervention, but despite it. That's right. Uh, you know, the, the grand fallacy is that the government had to intervene uh, in the Great Depression because of the massive unemployment. The, the, the plain fact easily verified is that after the stock market crash of 1929, there was never a month in which the, the unemployment was in double digits. Uh, two months after the stock market crash, unemployment peaked at 9%. It stayed there for one month, and it started drifting downward. By June 1930, the unemployment rate was 6.3%. That's when the federal government first intervened. It's only after interventions by Hoover, followed by bigger interventions by FDR, that we got this massive unemployment that lasted the entire decade. And that's legitimate numbers, probably. Back then, when they had unemployment, if you actually were not working, they counted you. So that was a more legitimate uh, unemployment number. I mean, look at the, the the way we count it now. The unemployment is much worse today than it was right after the stock market crash, despite all of the safety nets and government backstops. Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, it, uh, one of the ways the unemployment has come down a little bit has been that people simply stop looking for work. And when they stop looking for work, they're no longer counted as unemployed. Well, uh, you know, if, if everybody who's unemployed stopped, lo stopped looking for work, we'd have zero unemployment, but we'd be in a worse mess than we're in now. Yeah, well, th this is how, how the government helps the statistics. They make the employment situation so hopeless that people give up looking, and then they claim victory. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, part of what I think the problem is now, and maybe if you let me know if you disagree with me, is that there has been so much damage. Every time the government has tried to tried to get us out of a recession, they've done it by simply interjecting more more phony credit, more cheap money. And what they've done is they've encouraged more consumption and more spending and more borrowing. And as we spend this borrowed money, it gooses the GDP numbers. It creates some phony jobs that really don't have any any substance to them. And we pretend that we've solved the problem, but we dig ourselves in this huge hole and we cause our economy to evolve in an unsustainable way where it's based on spending and, and borrowing and not savings, investment, and production. And so we've built this, this, this house of sand that can only collapse. Well, well yes. And the, the other thing is that uh, a lot of this money that is poured out of Washington into various parts of the economy, uh, much of it just sits there. I mean, the banks have more money than now than they've ever had. Uh, corporations have more money than they've ever had. Uh, and yet uh, the banks aren't lending on the scale that would be needed to get us out of the recession. Uh, and, and the corporations certainly aren't hiring as many people. Uh, but no one asks the question, why are corporations with all this money not hiring people? And the answer is the government is making it more expensive to hire people by mandating all kinds of benefits 
that make the politicians look good and make the labor, uh, you know, less Well, affordable. absolutely. But it also works on the lending. Why are banks not lending? Well, number one, nobody is saving in those banks. Nobody is putting deposits in because there's no, there's no interest rate. And what money they are loaning out, well, it's going to the government. It's going to buy treasuries. It's going to finance student loans. It's going to finance home mortgages. It's going to all the places where the government is encouraging it through subsidies. And so there's nothing left for businesses. Well, actually, there, 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 there is a lot left in the banks, but now, in fact, that's one of the problems. They, that the banks are reluctant to lend, and of course, everyone would be reluctant to lend uh, when the government is almost on a monthly basis coming up with some new reasons why people who borrow money shouldn't have to pay it back. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, you, in fact, you wrote a, a book also about the housing boom and bust. I guess it, no, it came out in 2009. Did you write it before the bust, or when, when did you start that book? Oh, I would, it would, it, actually, I started in 2009. It was written in a very short time. And then uh, the second edition came out in 2010. And we call it a revised edition, but, I, but, I, but it really was a sort of a, a strengthened edition because m- most of the things that I said the previous year were substantiated by the events. And so yeah, that's probably really... one of the most frustrating things to watch Congress uh, regulate and, and, and pontificate about the housing bubble, even though it's government that caused it. And we can continue this uh, discussion after the break. Don't go away. We're talking with Thomas Sowell on ShiftRadio.com. To President Obama, Secretary Geithner, Madam Pelosi, and all of the socialist econ professors across America, we're sorry. We're sorry. Peter Schiff is back on the air. Welcome back, everybody. This is Peter Schiff, and I am talking to noted economist and a personal favorite of mine, Thomas Sowell. Mr. Sowell, now you also, you know, the book that we're talking about, your book, The Housing Boom and Bust. So in your uh, estimation, having looked over the markets, do you buy into the idea that the housing bubble resulted from capitalism run amok? Or was it government excess involvement in the mortgage market that lie at the root of the problem? It's the second, and, and uh, you know it's a very complicated situation. But the but one fact is, is crucial: uh, the pay, what made the, the bust occur is that people stopped making payments on their mortgages. Had people continued to pay off, pay off their mortgages as as uh, uh, planned, uh, then the, the the securities in Wall Street would have been all right, and so forth. So, uh, despite all the things that were done wrong in other places. Uh, what matters more most in, crea- in creating the uh, bust is that people stop paying their mortgages. And the question then is, why do they stop paying their mortgages? And the answer is because the government forced lenders to lend to people who were not likely to continue paying for their mortgages. And also, of course, a lot of people were led to speculate in the market based on artificially low standards, where the minute their house stopped rising in value, it no longer made sense to make their mortgage payments. They were, they were, they were suckered into this housing bubble by uh, the cheap interest rates from the Federal Reserve and guaranteed mortgages by Freddie and Fannie. Oh, yeah, and, but, but in, in many cases, and then this, this would be the professional speculators, they weren't suckered into it. They went into it whole hog. Um, you know, the, 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 what, something like 20% at the peak of the, of, the, of the bubble, something like 20% of the houses that were bought were bought on speculation not to live in but to be resold. And uh, that's a great game and huge amounts of money were made. Well, but, of course, once, once the housing uh, prices stopped rising, the speculators got out immediately. Yeah, you know, I made the argument, too, at the time that there was a lot more speculation going on than people thought because I think a lot of speculators were residing in their properties, so they weren't counted as speculators. But when people took out two- and three-year arms, when they had no intention of living in the house beyond the expiration period, when they, they were taking out mortgages they knew they couldn't afford, but they figured they'd flip them uh, in time, these were speculators, even though they were living in the property as they were speculating on its appreciation. Oh, absolutely. When I, when I said about, about 20% were speculators, I, I was referring only to those people who were speculating and not living in the houses. Yeah. If you would count the others, it would, be, it would obviously be an even higher percentage. 
Yeah, there were a lot of people doing, and all that was encouraged by by tax policy. You can you can the profits you made on real estate were tax free if you lived in it for two years. You got to deduct the interest, and you got a subsidized loan. You got a government backstop. This was an entire bubble. Let me ask you. So you wrote a book on housing. You studied it when when Congress when they had the hearings to try to figure out what caused the housing bubble. Were you asked to testify? Oh, no. Good heavens, no. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well no, the, I, no, I wasn't either. Uh, no, 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 I was I asked to testify up uh, by this uh, recent commission. Uh, I, I was very pleased that the Peter Wollaston of, uh, of uh, AEI was, and he just devastated the... Uh, yeah, the, the, and, and he 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 appeared on my show too and admitted that the whole thing was a farce. That they had no real attempt to discern uh, the cause of the crisis. They were looking to assign blame on capitalism so they can expand government, which is exactly what I said was going to happen from the beginning. That the whole thing was a charade. I think the people that, that they shouldn't even they should be in jail for holding these hearings because they're deceiving the public. They're pretending they're looking into the cause when they're simply trying to justify what they want to do anyway. And they're and and they and they reverse engineer. They stack the whole the whole procedure so that they get the conclusion they want well if you put in jail all of all the people who put out fraudulent uh, studies i mean you'd really have some prison overcrowding well that'd be okay as long as they were they were they were politicians we could yeah. make room for them look i want to ask you another question which i ask you know you not only are you a very distinguished free market economist but you also happen to be black which makes you even rarer uh, among economists that are not uh, indoctrinated uh, with Keynesianism, as you know, I, I'm a I'm Jewish uh, free market uh, Austrian economist, so I'm kind of rare in in my in my minority group as as well. But one of the things that I I constantly say, and I, I get heat from it because people say, "Oh, that's Peter, you're racist," but I'm of the opinion that laws against discrimination, laws that make it illegal for private companies to discriminate based on race actually have the perverse uh, co- consequence of encouraging discrimination where it wouldn't exist in other places. I think that there is more discrimination going on because of laws making it illegal to discriminate than there would be if those laws were repealed. What, what, what's your position on that? Well, it, 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 it is at the very least an empirical question uh, because one of the things that happens when you have these laws, and especially when you have them administered, in such a way that a very flimsy case is enough to keep keep a lawsuit going. Uh, you have people locating away from concentrations, for example, of uh, of, of the black population. Uh, there have been studies indicating that the Japanese, when they set up uh, factories in the United States, that they locate them away from where there are concentrations of black uh, people, uh, mainly because of the ease with which they can be accused of discrimination. Um, you know, well, if their numbers don't match the preconceptions of the government, exactly. It's not that you know. It's not that they're discriminating. They just they want to hire the best workers that they can. What they're trying to do is minimize their potential litigation. I think this is particularly important for small business where you only have two or three or four workers. You can't afford to get tied up in a lawsuit. You don't want to take a chance that you get a racially based lawsuit. So people that would never discriminate in a million years who are just trying to hire the best person, all of a sudden the government comes in and says, hey, if you want to hire this minority, you better be prepared. You, you know, Who knows? If you have to let them go because they don't do a good job, you are really exposed yourself, I think all they do is say, you know what, I don't want to take a risk, and so they, they back away. Uh, absolutely. Well, what is ironic is that uh, back in, uh, oh, I guess 100 years ago, uh, or thereabouts, uh, Henry Ford actually had, would send buses into the black community to get workers uh, for his factories. Of course, nobody's going to do, do that. Or very few people are going to do that today, because that would then open you up to, to litigation, uh, and litigation under rules in which uh, you can very easily be in the position of having to prove your innocence rather than have the, the complainant prove your guilt. And I think the empirical, if you look at the statistics, I don't think anybody can argue that we are a less tolerant society today than we were, let's say, in the 1930s or the 1940s or the 1950s. You'd have to say that we have certainly, there aren't as many people that harbor these kind of racial prejudices today as there were back then. Yet, if you look at all the economic statistics and you look at a black unemployment, whether it's teenage unemployment or adult unemployment, you look at illegitimacy rates, you look at all these statistics where you compare blacks to whites, blacks are in much worse shape financially than they are today. What's the reason? 
Well, wh- one other big thing, you mentioned the teenagers. In 1948, black teenagers' unemployment was a fraction of what it is today, and it was no different from white teenage unemployment. And that, that's not because there was less racism in 1948. It was because you didn't have these government programs uh, which make it more dangerous to hire a black. And, and particularly the minimum wage law as well, which makes it impossible or expensive to hire any young person who doesn't have skill. That's right. All right, well, Tom, thank you very much for being on my guest on my show today. I'm a big fan of yours, and I encourage everybody to read uh, this basic economics. And i got to get it up on my reading list to get it up to date, because there's a lot more that you've written since Knowledge and Decision. I want to play some sound. This is from the doctors. Now, remember, a lot of these teachers in Wisconsin have been calling in sick. And, of course, they got notes, right? And a lot of kids, you know, when you don't want, you know, we, we bring notes to the, to, to the teacher uh, when, when, when the kids are sick. And, of course, you know, the, the big, it's a big thing in school if you bring a fraudulent note, right? If you make up your own sick note in order to justify or get an excuse because you ditched class or you cut school, however you want to refer to it. Well, listen to what the teachers themselves are doing. Here, play cut number nine. Are you signing? Are you signing doctor's notes? Uh, yes, I am. Do, is, do you have any problem with having people lie? Uh, excuse me. I'm not lying. No, don't put it. But, I'm doing consultations for patients right now. But most people, you know, you know very well that most of these people have been missing work to protest. You don't have a problem with Would this? You please get out of my way. You, you don't have any problem with this, ma'am? Ma'am, you're engaging in 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 fraudulent behavior. Okay, so here's a doctor. And, and, and she's actually compounding the problem by claiming that she's not lying, that she's out there surrounded by protesters doing patient consultations. You know, if the patients are out there protesting, she knows they're not sick. Why does this doctor still have a license? Any doctor who knowingly falsifies a sick note so that somebody can go out and protest instead of doing their job ought to lose their license. And what about the teachers? Who are doing this? Why aren't they getting fired? Play, uh, this is more of this stuff. Play cut number 10. Some people up here are saying it's an illegal job action to not come into work today. That was her sick. Come on, we're sick and tired of Scott Walker. Uh, what, is, that, is that all we got? <laughs> I, thought, I thought there was more from that clip. But anyway, that was uh, somebody who, it was, this is a, 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 a teacher who is claiming, and I, I, according to my notes, I couldn't hear it. She said, we are sick. We're sick and tired of Scott, Brown, of Scott Walker, the governor. So that's being sick. They don't have a real medical sickness. They're just sick of the governor, and so therefore they're justified in calling in sick. Yeah, you know, what if their students did that? You know, yeah, I'm sick of going to school. I'm sick of taking tests. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the day off, and I'm going to falsify, falsify a note. Remember that, that teacher that said she was out there for the kids? You know, what kind of message are you sending to your students when the teachers are faking sick notes, when the teachers are missing school because they're making up being sick and they're putting in phony notes, what, what does that say to the kids? How are you a role model when you're telling your students, hey, if you don't feel like going to class because you just are sick of school, right, and it's a nice day out and you're sick of taking tests and, and you just want to just, just forge a note and pretend you're sick. After all, that's exactly what your teacher did when your teacher didn't want to show up for work, when your teacher didn't want to go to school. I mean, come on. I mean, this, this, this is the worst example that we can be set, setting for our kids. Now, also, apparently, this movement is spreading now. It's not just Wisconsin. You've got a newly elected Republican governor in Indiana, and here they've got a, a, uh, a right-to-work uh, rule that is now pending where, you know, there, you have some states where you have a right to work states and other states you don't have the right to work or your unionized states. And, and, and what that means is if you're in a state that isn't one of these right to work states, if you get a job at a company where there is a unionized workforce, you have no choice. You have to be a member of that union. You have to pay the dues or you can't work there. What the right to work states say is that no, you've got a right to work. You you don't you have to want to be a member of that union. That you can still work at that company and not be a dues paying member of the union. Now, who would be opposed to that? I mean, why can't people have a choice? 
Why can't you decide, I want to be represented by a union or I'll take my chances on my own? That's the way it should be. But the unions say no. The unions want to force participation. They want to make it mandatory. They want to hold all the workers hostage. They want to say, if you want a job at this company, then you are required to be a member of this union. And if you're not a member of this union, if you don't pay and pay the dues and, and uh, abide by the rules that we set, then you can't have a job there. That is ridiculous. And now Indiana wants to change this and become a, a right to work state. And this is now a, another a battleground. Anyway, the music is already playing. I can't believe I used up this entire segment. 